Uh, hello everyone. Good morning. Uh, my name is Shailendra. I'm the host of today's uh, Zoom meeting. So today's uh, topic will be uh, Ali in Canvas and the speakers are Adero Allison and Mary Loader and uh, they'll be handling the Zoom meeting from now on. Thank you. Thank you, Shailendra. Um, so we're going to be talking today about your allies in accessible course design and specifically around our new tool, Ally, which is inside of Canvas, but is actually a product of Blackboard. Um, my name is Mary Loader, and I'm an instructional design specialist with ASU Online, and I'm joined today by Adaro Allison, the assistant director of the Disability Resource Center, and her specific modality is the alternative media. Adaro, if you wouldn't mind saying something about yourself. Oh, Adaro, you're on mute. I signed in on mute, sorry. Good morning, glad to be here. Um, another role I have is that of co-chair of the Accessibility Project. And if anyone is interested in working with accessibility at ASU, just let me know and we'll put you in our committee. Excellent. And so today, Adaro and I are going to be switching off and kind of injecting our own information and um, knowledge, but we're going to be talking about accessibility for all. So universal design for learning accessibility is really the, the baseline of that. We'll review some WCAG compliance and the benefits of using Ally and share remediation tips using Ally and the Canvas tool. And then we'll also talk about some additional resources and training that you can seek out if you so choose. Um, I'm not sure I see the caption as an option. Can everyone see the captions that needs it? Let's Can you see them now? Just wanna make sure before we get started, anyone who needs captions can see them. Yeah, the captions are running. If you click the CC at the bottom of your screen, you should be able to see them. And if you wouldn't mind putting that in the chat, just in case anyone who's attending um, has a hearing impairment and can't hear us so that they know how to get to that. Um, there's typically like three dots in the menu that they can access to turn on those subtitles. Okay, so we're gonna start off with Make universal sure that goes design. to everybody. Oh, sure, yeah. All right. Great. So let's start off with universal design for learning. And universal design for learning is um, a concept that we want to use throughout the university. Um, the idea around universal design for learning is to really ensure that all of the networks of the brain that help with supporting learning and uh, making learning sticky are activated. And so here we have images of the three brains um, and the three networks that are associated with learning. So the effective networks, um, which are the why of learning, the recognition networks, which are the what of learning, and the strategic networks, how we learn. Um, and UDL is based on uh, neuroscience networks that control how learners interact in learning settings, and it is mostly supported by the accessibility of materials. And that's not just true for the ability spectrum, but also in reference to a preference of learning um, and so there are different reasons that individuals might want to um, access different formats for learning materials, such as um, like if you're in a noisy area, it might be nice to have captions to be able to turn on so that you can read the material rather than having to listen to it. Or if you're on the go and you'd like to download an audio version of a PDF or of another document that a professor has posted. So there's a lot of different needs for the universal design for learning and accessibility is where all of it starts. So universal design for learning um, is about accessibility for all and accessibility is necessary for some, but as I said, it is beneficial for all. It's not just about special cases that may or may not have been um, highlighted to the Disability Resource Center. Um, and if you could do something now that could benefit all students, why wouldn't you do it, right? So what are some things, if you don't mind in the chat sharing with us, that you could do to make your course more accessible. If you are a faculty member, it'd be great to hear how you've thought about making your courses more accessible. And we'll check into the chat in just a little bit. Okay, so I want you to consider this. This is kind of a nice little exercise around 
um, design itself. So this isn't about learning, but it's about architecture. So um, this building itself is very, very beautiful. It's um, got a lot of windows. There's a really beautiful aesthetic value to the front of the building. Uh, there's a really deep stairs, um, but there's something that's missing from this image. So we've got some double doors that could open to allow anyone with a wheelchair in and we have stairs, but what is missing? And feel free to put that in the chat. I'd love to uh, hear from you. What is obviously missing? How do yeah, they get how do they get doors? <laughs> Absolutely, there isn't a ramp, right? And so the idea here is that now that we have um, the need for ADA and making sure anyone can access any area, which is wonderful that our society is now focused on that, we're gonna have to go in after the fact in this design and add ramps. And typically what happens in buildings like this, there is not space for a ramp. So they'll often make individual um, individuals that need to use an accessible doorway go around back and just how does that make someone feel right as a culture we don't want anyone to feel that they are going to have to access in a different way purely because we didn't think about them in the first place so now let's consider this image and this is actually um, the university or pardon me the college of arts and science at the university of saskatchewan and in this building as a part of the design everyone uses a very long switchback ramp to access the first or the second level from the first level and so how inclusive is this design right like anyone who comes into this building can easily access any part of this building and so this is just a really good representation of how when we take design considerations up front for all users how all benefit and how it can fit in naturally with the design of the course and make everyone feel welcome um, and so I, I kind of like that exercise again. And Adara, I'm going to turn this over to you for WCAG compliance and discussing what WCAG is and all the things we need to consider. All right. So the uh, WCAG is uh, really web uh, accessibility guidelines that uh, provide a way to make anything on the internet more accessible to more people. And the guidelines include things like being perceivable, being operable, being understandable, and robust. So um, we actually have a slide that breaks that down more but you know when i think about perceivable i just think about why would you write a course and prepare all of your materials if you didn't want someone to actually be able to see and learn from those materials so you want to make sure that they can access the information that you prepared um, you want to make sure that the the course is operable that that if there are connections that a person needs to make whether it's uh, clicking a button or uh, responding to a question that there's a way for them to do that so some people are not able to use the keyboard and they may use a switch that allows them to click once or twice and use an on-screen keyboard but if your platform doesn't allow them to use that switch they're blocked from interacting with your materials. Uh, the materials have to be understandable broadly to, to anyone. And then robust applies to not only the quality of the materials in terms of their education, make sure that the person is getting the value that all other students are getting, but also that the information shared in one way, verbally, is shared in another way with just as much detail so that whether a person is getting it verbally, getting it through captions and transcripts, or getting it through uh, visual media, that they're still getting all of the information. Okay, moving on. Um, we have issues that uh, stem from the reactive approach more than from the uh, process. Um, we need to change the culture because the reactive approach doesn't allow for timely access to materials. Uh, if we had used the auto caption in Zoom, then individuals who could not hear us would have to wait until we shared the video to learn what we said today. Um, 
that doesn't allow for timely access to materials, makes it difficult for students to stay on task, to stay engaged. It diminishes the sense of independence and autonomy because there's that waiting factor again, waiting for someone else to do something before you can participate. And some students just don't report disabilities due to stigma, uh, especially students who are um, uh, uh, connecting to the university from a distance online all of the time and have not uh, even realized there is a disability resources office. They're assuming that because it's online, it will be accessible to them. A proactive approach can help amend these and create a more accessible experience for all. Uh, so some of the questions that I like to ask, and that's on the next slide. Um, uh, well, things that I like to think about actually is if you say to a student, you don't have to do this assignment or read this article, I'll just give you credit for it anyway. Don't worry about it. I'll figure something out. What your student actually hears is, I don't care whether you understand the entire course, you probably wouldn't understand this anyway. You just aren't as important as my other students. Your content matters to every person who's paid to take this educational opportunity. Your content matters to every person seated in a chair, whether they're in a wheelchair or a chair in their living room or a chair sitting in front of you. Your content matters to every single person attending. So you want to make sure that they have full access to that content. Okay, Mary, I'm going to bounce it back to you. Okay. So it's nice that we have um, not only the Ally tool, which I'll review in a moment, but also inherent inside of our learning management system canvas, we have an accessibility checker. They do different things. And so it's important to understand that. And neither one of them checks video. So that's going to be something that you will have to do on your own when you're doing content curation is really making sure any videos that you choose to use from outside sources have captions already available or contact the owner of those videos and ask them if they could add captions. That's another option. And then of course, any videos that you make, make sure that you're adding captions to those videos directly. All right, so now to our accessibility allies. So Ally itself will evaluate any file that's in the course. And so that's a really nice tool. Anything that you load in, PDFs, PowerPoints, images that you use along the entire course of the LMS system will be checked by Ally. And it's actually very easy to access Ally, it's inside the files of the course itself, and it actually will have a gauge that's visible to instructors only um, each time an image or a file type appears anywhere within the course. Um, and then you can also access different remediation tips that are inside of Ally directly from that gauge that displays. And then in Canvas, it will access all of the pages or the discussions or the assignments, um, the quizzes, anything inside of the course that is inherent to the learning management system will be checked by Canvas's accessibility checker. And to access the Canvas accessibility checker, you do that from inside the edit portion of whatever page or discussion or assignment or quiz that you're on. And there's an icon that you'll see later um, that you would click. And then it provides brief instruction on how to make that content more accessible in that exact moment. And then they, they throw a little party for you if you get everything right. So it's kind of fun. Um, all right, so I'm just going to go through some information about allies specifically. And this is from the student's perspective, except for the gauge, because students do not see gauges. But from any file that they access in the course, they're going to have a drop down arrow. So you can see that next to the hardware list PDF that I have listed there. When they click that arrow, it then gives them options on how they want to interact with that file. So if it's a PDF or a PowerPoint, there's an option to preview that file which doesn't embed the file without actually downloading it. But then there's also the option to download it. And then just underneath the download option is alternative formats. And that is Ally. So from the student's perspective, it provides alternative formats to access materials. And you can see from the um, image that's posted here, and there is alt text for anyone that's going to be accessing this afterwards. But there's HTML, which allows for viewing in the browser or on a mobile device. There's an ePublish so that you can actually access this offline. There's electronic Braille, which I think is amazing. 
There's an audio version, which is probably the most common usage next to a translated version. And then there's also Beeline readers. What's also available but not visible in this image is an OCR. And so if the PDF itself is not accessible, there is a tool in there to make it more accessible right in that moment, which is not always the preference, but it is an option when you start to go in and make your PDFs accessible. You can run it through the OCR ed before you go through the other steps to properly tag and fix your PDF for it to be properly accessible. Then let's look at it from the faculty perspective. And this is brand new. So if you're a faculty member, I encourage you to go into your courses and check out your Ally dashboard. And the Ally dashboard does a composition of all files in your course and displays an overview for you. So you'll see what your course content is within that diagram. And then in addition, it's gonna give you an accessibility score overall. And if you click on the content area, it will show you which content you could go in and fix in that moment. So it's a really nice view of your entire course. It's kind of fun to see your accessibility score improve. So I highly recommend getting into that Ally dashboard. And then let's look at it from the most common access point when you're starting to do remediation of your course. And that is from the file section of your Canvas course. So if you click on files, you'll often see just your files listed there. But now with Ally, you're going to see a column that says accessibility. And under that column, you'll see gauges that provide a visual score in a color perspective for what needs help. So if it's red, it needs a lot of help. If it's um, orange, yellow, it needs um, probably a little bit more help, but it's partially um, accessible. And if it's green, it's almost there, but if it's dark green, it's perfect. And that's what we're going for. We're going for perfection. However, let's keep in mind that we don't wanna drive ourselves crazy. So let's do it by iterative design. Find the easiest things to add content to, to improve your course, the most important areas, and then work from there. Each session, improving your course just a little bit better. So I don't expect you to um, go outside of um, you know, your normal work schedule and work overnight to make every course you have accessible. Although if you're driven to do so after this, by all means. But what's really important is that you're just trying um, every day to improve your courses and your content, each session taking a little chunk and making it a little bit better. And then your Disability Resource Center is still available to you and the students who absolutely need 100% 100 access and an accessible nature to provide that service to you. So I just wanna be very clear that just because Ally exists and we're teaching you how to do these things, it's, you're not alone. You have so many resources available. Um, and Heather, I think that your faculty, so you've asked um, when you say you, I, you mean the student. Um, the student actually won't see anything um, that is in the Ally course except for the alternative format option. So when I say you, I really actually mean um, the faculty. Although the faculty also have options to see the alternative format. So when I say you, when using that alternative format to change PDFs into a more accessible version with the OCR ed, yes, I do mean you, the faculty, you can use that. So can the students to make your documents a little bit more accessible without going through um, the Disability Resource Center. Okay, thank you for that question. Um, now we also have a little bit more information around Ally and why it's helpful. So just like Canvas, when there's something that needs remediation, there are tools available and resources available directly within that experience. So if you get in and the process kind of works like this, you'll see your gauge next to your file, you'll click on it. It'll show you your percentage score instead of just the color. Then it will also give you different feedback and descriptions on how to fix what's going on. And if it's a, a JPEG or a PNG, those image files, you can add a description right there. You don't have to leave that process. If it's a PDF, you won't be able to remediate it right there. You will have to do that offline and then load that new file back in. But it is nice to be able to do this for images. So that might be the first place to start is with your images. Something else to consider with images, if it is decorative, you don't need to actually put a description in. You can mark it decorative that is an option there. And then after you're done improving your file, it shows you the score, which is fantastic. And we will be giving examples um, of remediating a, remediating a PDF, like as far as the process goes. Um, but there's actually a session later today by Julie Allen, I believe, um, showing how to do different remediation tips. So I highly recommend it. <laughs> 
So here's some quick remediation tips that we've already covered. And um, I'm going to turn this over to Adero for this. All right. So um, quick tips are really basic. Images have to have an alt text, uh, which is text alternatives to just looking at the picture. If a person can't see the picture, they need to know what's in the picture to know why it matters for your course. Uh, just an FYI, if you have a picture and what's important is the shape of an object and there are words on the screen that you don't care about, when you don't put those words in the alt text, it will not give you 100%, but I think that's okay as long as it says what is needed for your class. You are the only one that really will know that. Uh, PDF formatting has to be for screen readers so that the text may be read by a screen reader. Uh, so if it's saved as an image file, nothing comes through. If you have a Word document and you save it as a PDF, it should translate. But if you print it as a PDF, it, it, it erases all of your accessibility. So be careful of that. Uh, check your Canvas courses and your Word documents. Make sure you're using heading styles. Um, the styles features in your programs are meant to provide accessibility. And uh, if you have videos, they need to have closed captions and transcripts. The uh, reason we, we like you to do your own captions and transcripts, or captions primarily, is so that they are accurate. You know, if you send me your video, and I have to hear what you say and type it up and I misinterpret one of the words and spell it wrong, your student could get, be getting totally wrong information, especially if they're in biology, math, chemistry. There are a lot of terms that I wouldn't know that you would know instantly just by the context. So if you start out with a, a transcript and you upload that to your videos, and then edit, that will make for a perfect uh, follow-up for anyone who has to use the captions of the video. Let's see. Um, oh, you want a, an example of remediating a PDF offline? Um, you download your PDF and uh, uh, sometimes you'll find that your PDF has images that don't have alt text. I, I checked one in my um, accessibility course and it has images that are not, don't have alt text. I need to go into the PDF and mark each of those images as decorative because basically it's a bunch of asterisks across the top of a page. <laughs> so that would be remediating offline. After I've done that, then I will have to upload the PDF again and there won't be uh, the sense that, oh, your images don't have alt text. So just marking them decorative in that case. Uh, let me see, what other questions do we have? Heading styles. When you go into Word and you choose a heading, it will say heading one, heading two, heading three, and it, uh, it basically levels them out so that Heading one is typically the topic, the topic for the page. In fact, in Canvas, having what, he, heading one is the title of the page, and then within a page, you only have choices from two on. If you use those styles, instead of using capital letters or making it a bigger font, then a screen reader will recognize heading, accessibility and images, content, and then you go and read the content. If, on the other hand, you choose to use just capitals and, and large uh, font, there is no way for your person using a screen reader to know when there's been a heading. Hope that's helpful. Um, okay, so um, accessibility in images. Are images decorative or content related? Is content in the image perceivable? If you notice the top image, uh, these are chipboard images and they have numbers on them. Uh, the top one has black numbers on a very busy background that you can barely see. In fact, at a quick glance, I didn't even realize there were numbers there until I read the alt text. But uh, one, two, three, four, and five are numbered. And if a person needed to know those numbers and what was there, they would not necessarily see that. 
So try and find a figure ground color so that the numbers stand out more. On the lower image, the same image, the numbers are white. They do step out a little bit more from the background. Um, another alternative might be to put the numbers outside with an arrow pointing to the spot they represent. Describe the content in a way in the alternative text so that a person listening will also be able to follow. Another example we have is of a, a graph in color. Um, the graph is, uh, shows our favorite ice cream flavors in the United States uh, in 2019. As you can see on this graph, they used the, the uh, words and the percentages outside pointing to the colors. So there's no figure ground problem. So, but the question is, what kind of alt text would you put with this for someone who couldn't see the graph? Yeah, so please- Anyone have any ideas? Please, uh, please type in the chat what kind of alt text you would use to describe this. It shouldn't take too long. And it should be said that this is not research-based. This is, <laughs> this yeah. is preference based by Julie Allen, who is wonderful, um, and created this as a sample for this type of activity. Um, so she clearly is crazy because caramel is not the best. I believe it would be vanilla Ooh. or chocolate. No, 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 not caramel. <laughs> 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 but what kind of alt text would you use to describe this graph? How would you describe the figure what's important. Um, we'll show you what we think, but we'd love to hear what you think based in the chat. We'll give you just a few more moments to do this. And then just to mention again, as Adero did before, um, sometimes images do not have value. They are, they're aesthetic. They're really not meant to be part of the learning experience, like icons. And so it's important when you're using Canvas or the accessibility tool Ally that you're marking them as decorative so that we're not clouding the audio output of a JAWS or a screen reader system. Um, it can get a little noisy when using those. And so it's really important to remove anything that isn't actually adding value. So it's possible no one feels safe enough to type um, what this alt text would be. So we'll just well, show you. It's before, no we, before we give the examples, let me just say that there are some people who don't consider themselves as having a disability, but who might have some level of colorblindness. Yes. So do not put any information in that is only shown by color. Make sure you put those labels on, that's really key. Agreed, and dividing lines too. Like if you notice in this um, circular graph, there are no lines between. Mm -hmm. And so if there were borders to these different pie pieces, it would be easier to discern that these were different sections as well. So considering that contrast again. All right, here's what we think. And there's a couple of ways to write it. So one, you can just regurgitate what was written there, but written it out in long form. So favorite ice cream flavors of the United States, the percentages, the types, or you can tell them what mattered to you. So caramel is the most important ice cream flavor in the United States in 2019. So you can see how the description is changed slightly to bring focus to what mattered from that image. And that's what we want you to do with alt text. And then sometimes your alt text isn't going to fit in the like 120 character, I think, count that you have for alt text. And so if that's the case, you can always link a Google document or a Word document um, or use a caption to describe the image. It's all learners are going to benefit from you describing the value of an image. So um, something really important is to mention um, what mattered to you, what, where it came from, the figures that matter, how you want that student to interact with that image and how it matters to their learning. So just something to be aware of. Yeah, remember the uh, work you had to do on your dissertation where you said, figure one shows. <laughs> exactly. All right, so we're gonna move into PDFs. This is probably the scariest place for all faculty. And I've gotta be honest, even as an instructional designer, I am not perfect at this either. I lean on my friends like Julie Allen and Adaro and Kathy Marks, our web accessibility specialist, to teach me and my student workers who are helping us make things accessible at ASU Online. 
um, how to do so properly. So just keep that in mind, no one's perfect. But here's what we do. So first, if you're curating content, use the ASU Reading Library list to do so. That's something that you can access within Canvas directly or you can go to their website and begin your own list and then they can help you associate it with your course after the fact. But the reason you'd wanna use the ASU Reading Library list resources is because the library has made a dedication to ensure that all of their electronic items, and they are trying to work backwards as well to make old items accessible, but all of their digital assets will be considered accessible when asked to use in a course. So it's wonderful that they're putting the resources out there, that they've taken that on. So when you, whenever possible, use our reading um, library list and the ASU library to curate your content. Also, we have a web accessibility specialist who built an entire web accessibility site. And on that site, there's a ton of great information, but specifically there's best practices and how to information around mm -hmm. PDFs, what tools to use, how to do certain things, why you need to do certain things. And there's even a checker there. Um, we use uh, Acrobat Pro because they have an accessibility tool that's only available in Pro. So if you need to ask for access to that, please do so. Um, but in that tool, there is an automated function where you'll run the accessibility checker for a PDF and then it will tell you, hey, there's 10 places that need to be fixed and overwhelmingly it's an auto fix because the system's that smart. So you'll click on what needs to be fixed and then you'll click fix and it fixes it for you. It's wonderful. There are some areas like tagging certain sections or the um, the way you want the reader to move through that text, maybe it has an image to the side, so what do you want it to do first? Read the section of text before it reads the image, that kind of thing that you're gonna have to be involved in. But for the most part, it will do it. And you can get access to Acrobat Pro by contacting RTS. So definitely um, let them know that you need a copy of it and why you need a copy of it and they'll help you get it. And then you also have access to the Web Accessibility Clinic, which is run by Kathy Marks, our Web Accessibility Specialist out of the University Technology Office. You all probably met her in our kickoff call. She's wonderful and she dedicates every Wednesday from one to five. There are appointment slots that you can come in with whatever you need help with and she will sit with you side by side or Zoom to Zoom and help you fix what you're working on. Her name is Kathy Marks, but you can sign up for her web accessibility clinic by going to webaccessibility.asu.edu and we will be sending this um, PowerPoint out to everyone so you will have access to all the resources we're talking about today as well. All right, um, Adara, did you wanna talk about Canvas and the document headers again? There's some images that might help kind of put context to what you are saying before. Yes, I think that would be helpful. Um, as you can see, uh, when you uh, select that you're creating headers, especially in Google or Canvas, you have an option to have everything as paragraph or in Google it's normal, uh, and that's your, just your basic text, or you can select a header in Canvas, like I said before, the page is already gonna be header one. So header two is what you can use within the body of the page. Uh, when you use the header designations, they step down in size. Uh, sometimes they change the style of the font a little bit, but basically the important part is that a screen reader will say header before it reads what the content is, allowing a person who cannot see the, the visual distinctions to follow what has been presented and the order that you want it presented in. Um, and the other thing, video, someone asked earlier in the uh, chat about uh, YouTube. And as you can see, we have Media Amp, YouTube, and Wistia all listed here. If you want to do captions, um, Media Amp and YouTube do auto captions. I'm not sure, does Wistia do auto captions? It does, it does do auto captions. And they're about as accurate as Media Amp and YouTube. <laughs> yeah, which makes them somewhere between 88 and 90% accurate. So if you really want your students to learn what you're teaching, as opposed to, uh, let me see, I did a presentation and I said, use your Azurite sign-in. And it said, use your as, A-S-U-Y-O-U, write, W-R-I-T-E, sign in. You need to go back and edit to make sure that it really says what you want it to say. So I have no problem with auto caption. 
our students uh, lab staff use auto caption, but then they go back and they edit and the editing is key for clarity and for accuracy. Uh, we really encourage you to do that yourself because you are the person who understands the content. Um, if you are reading a script, uh, YouTube will allow you to upload that script as your transcript and then it will have 99.9% .9 of it accurate in the first place and you may only have to correct a couple of things because obviously when we're re reading a script, we, we step off, off script sometimes and have asides that may not be as accurate. But by all means, start with the auto caption and then edit. Mm. And it should be noted that for Media Amp, you may need to contact the University Technology Office to have that functionality of creating captions turned on in your profile. So if you don't see captions clearly when you um, move into your Media Amp file or your account, just contact the UTO. They may just need to flip a switch for you. For YouTube, it's available to all. So I would actually also recommend to teach our students to be accessibly minded. And when they turn in things and they use YouTube to create videos, teach them how to be accessible. Um, there are a lot of different videos on YouTube. We have one linked there that you can share on how to create accessible um, videos. And as Adara mentioned, you can actually upload a transcript and transcribe and sync. So if they have a script or you have a script and you're using YouTube to host your video, you can use the transcribe and sync to create very accurate captions. It's kind of scary how accurate YouTube is in reference to associating your text with the audio files that are coming through. And then with Wistia, there's two different options for Wistia. So there is the automatic speech recognition tool, but then if you are using Wistia and there's a disability resource need, um, we do use uh, more advanced and not, not, not something that you need to edit. And now something else with Wistia is that there's actually a transcript that overlays on top of the video and is searchable. So we love Wistia over at ASU Online for that reason. And creating videos in Zoom, there is um, a transcript that occurs when you do a recording in Zoom. However, it does not present as captioning. So that's just something to be aware of. Um, and always make sure that it's edited. Yes, absolutely, Lori. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, it's not just spelling, but also grammar. YouTube doesn't do any capitalization or punctuation. So that's really important to go back in and put in there. Media Amp and Wistia are a little bit better. They do some capitalization, some punctuation, but it's not always appropriate. So definitely get in there and make that as perfect as you can. And also, um, I wanted to mention, and this is something we use in a lot of our webinars at ASU Online, you can use um, PowerPoint and Google Slides, and there's a captioning, auto captioning option within those. If you're hosting a course on Zoom and you're using PowerPoint or you're using Google Slides to host that, you can use the auto caption. That's something, it's better than nothing, right? And all students will benefit from those captions. So if it's not for a disability resource need where it has to be 100%, I still recommend turning on the captioning because it helps with context and absorbing the information that you're using. So that's a fantastic tool to use as well. All right, so we're gonna kind of wrap this up and just mention some things we've already talked about. So the ASU web accessibility site is available to you. There is a plethora of information. So please, um, please definitely check that site out. Um, you can also schedule an appointment. We've made that easy with the link there. And the UTO does have training for Ally. And so you are welcome to go and take their self-led tutorial or actually schedule Ally and accessibility training um, directly one-to-one -one or um, as a group. There's different options there on their site. And then we also have an ASU online webinar coming up on pedagogy and Ally and also some accessibility um, webinars that are gonna be hosted by Julie Allen. So um, definitely check out our ASU online Eventbrite. There's a lot of great webinars being held there, but specifically on the 10th of June, the 16th of July and the 23rd of July, we will have accessibility minded webinars that are being hosted. And I just wanted to reiterate for those who are listening that are not able to access the chat easily, um, you should also be aware that um, while PowerPoint and slides do make something accessible, it's not an accommodation for deaf of heart or hard of hearing students. So just wanted to make sure that that's known. And then also 
You may want to consider future use. If not accessible now, it will need to be later. Thank you so much for that as well, Julie. And so you are welcome to use um, YouTube if you are hosting something on Zoom and you need to load that um, file into a site, you could use YouTube and you could use their auto captioning and then edit that. Um, so something to be aware of or also and also send out the transcript and the chat. So it saves both things in Zoom when you host a meeting. And that's a really nice thing to give to students because not all the learning happens from your lecture. It also happens within the chat and the interactions that take place. And so the transcript and the chat, because they are saved when you make those files and save them to your computer or to the cloud, um, those are great things to also consider uploading into your course or sending out to your students by email once you've completed a lecture and recorded it. Then. Uh, Adara, did you have anything else you wanted to add to this as well before we open up for questions? Uh, no, I just think, you know, when you make your courses accessible and when you teach your students to make their submissions accessible, you're not only impacting the people in that one course, you are impacting people for decades moving beyond that because your students will take that out and use it in their jobs and it will spread access throughout the world. And do we have any questions that you guys want to um, kind of review? You're welcome to take yourselves off of mute or, or ask questions in the chat. Either way works for us. Well, thank you so much for choosing our session to come to today. I, am, I hope you'll stick around and listen to additional questions that are being posed throughout all the other sessions and learn a lot from all of our other experts that are joining us for our Global Accessibility Awareness Day. Um, thank you so much for attending. And if you do have any questions that you'd like to email either one of us, you're welcome to do so. I'm gonna put my email in the chat and Adaro, I'm sure she'll put her email in the chat as well. You're welcome to email us directly. Um, we're glad if you've taken something from it, feel like you can apply it moving forward. Um, it's really up to all of us to change the culture and it starts with us. Thank you so much for coming today. I'm in the chat. <laughs> and I'm going to stop sharing and we can open this up to um, any questions that anyone might have um, outside of this experience here. Hi, I have a quick question. Sure. Actually, I might have several, I don't know. So um, <laughs> my uh, colleague, um, Annika Mann, is all, she's in another session. We're kind of both trying to cover all of our bases in this workshop today. Yeah. Um, and she and I are teaching um, a, a humanities lab in the fall that the content of the lab is focused on disability. Um, and we already know that we have several students with accommodation needs who are taking the class and we're still trying to figure out if we're even going to, I mean, I know the university is trying to figure out if we're going to be meeting in person, but we're just individually trying to figure out how we want to approach this particular lab because we no, already know we have a particular population of students in the lab. Um, even though it's designed to be interactive and community based, we've got to figure all that out. Um, but one of uh, this is so this is an idiosyncratic question. Um, I was um, talking with another um, person who does educational technology stuff and she was talking about some pretty uh, particularly using Zoom um, really low tech things like I mean I just happen to have this but like you've made this thing and you're like one you, you want to hold something up and you want to be like this is a handwritten thing um like as if you were writing on the board or or whatever um and and that just seemed like so exciting and so easy but then it doesn't necessarily seem very accessible um so I, uh, how do we think about translating those kinds of things like AKA writing on the board um, into a virtual context? One of the things that's uh, really important, uh, whether you're virtual or in the classroom, when you're writing on the board is to make sure that you are speaking aloud what you're writing on the board because uh, both uh, students who can't see the board clearly which uh, even with my corrective lenses, I sit in the front row because I don't really see the board clearly. 
um, students who don't hear what you're saying and have a CART provider typing or an interpreter interpreting, all of those need you to say what's going on. You know, if you have an interpreter in the room and you have a whole room full of students, the interpreter is facing the students. So as soon as you start writing on the board and stop talking, everything stops. The interpreter doesn't know what to say because you're not talking. That kind of uh, reiterating what you're, you're writing is what's key. And same thing when you hold up something. If you're going to hold it up, then say what it is you're holding up. What are the significant pieces you want people to see from that? Thank you. Yeah, and if you're going to be disseminating items after the fact, like images that you may have taken a picture of, you can always provide like a text space. Maybe you have a really dynamic image, but really it's just about like five things and how they connect to one another in a certain order. So you could just type that out really fast. That's the same experience for the person that has um, any kind of ability issues around sight. So it's just something to consider is that what do you really want them to get out of it? Although the drawings are really fun, what's the baseline material they need to be able to understand and how does that relate? Great, thank you, that's helpful. Um, and uh, we had in the chat also the, the concern that someone who's colorblind would not be able to follow that chart. So really reiterating the important points is, is really the key to anything that you present and making sure that anything important is presented in multiple modes. Thanks for that. Anyone else have any questions before we get going? All right, Shalendra, we're gonna pass this back to you um, for a little wrap up and to let them know when to return for the next session and what they're gonna expect in this room. Uh, thank you. The next session will be at 10.15 a.m. So uh, there will be a 15 minute break and you, you guys can join at 10.15 and the next session uh, Will uh, the speaker will be Sara Lee, and uh, we'll meet at 10:15 a.m. Yeah. Thank you, Shalandra, and thank you to all who attended today. We'll see you throughout the day in other sessions. Take care. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hmm?